It's the movie which inspired thousands upon thousands of poorly written media studies coursework, The Departed, which is going undercover on today's episode of that song from that movie. Thank you for joining that song from that movie, our journey through the very best and worst of movie songs. I'm your undercover for the Boston Police Department host, Dietrich, and I'm joined today by... He doesn't want to be a product of his environment. He wants his environment to be a product of him. It's Alex. <laughs> That's a motto I've always lived by. <laughs> and if I'm the guy who does his job, he must be the other guy. It's Ben. That's great. I was just going to go, you're a corp. Corp? <laughs> Your cat. Oh, is that Mark Wahlberg, that quote? Yeah, it will be. I, I very much enjoy him in the cinema as well. He is fantastic. <laughs> isn't he in the other guys, the movie? Yeah, yeah. I think he is, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he has some absolutely fantastic lines in this film. Yeah. And I want you to hit, say them all with his Boston accent. <laughs> I prefer the accentuated Boston accent he has in Ted, where he kind of lives it up a bit more. How are we all today? I mean, it's beautiful outside, so, you know, I've had to make sure to close all the windows and <laughs> everything to keep the sound in, because this mic is sensitive. It's just not beautiful here. <laughs> really? It's like overcast where I am. Oh, wow. No, it's like short weather here. It's scorching. Really? We're really not helping the uh, stereotype of British people complaining about the weather. No. Nope. <laughs> we uh, do a movie and music podcast, and we spend the first five minutes talking about the weather each week. <laughs> the weather is nicer in Boston. Do you back to films? Has anyone watched any good films lately? No. <laughs> I rewatched Parasite last night. Oh, that's good. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is you know is absolutely amazing. Was it still amazing on a on a rewatch? Yeah, I think even better in some ways because just noticed a lot more. I watched a, a video last night that was all about the CGI of Parasite, and half the film is on like green screens. It's ridiculous. Really, would never have thought. Like the street where you see like the side of the house. That little bit of the house is real, and the rest of it is just like a green street. Uh, a green, a green street. street. <laughs> 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 it's Danny Dyer's there. <laughs> no, that's Bubble Factory. That's what Elijah Wood's there. Elijah Wood, yeah. <laughs> Elijah Wood in the new Bong Joon Ho film. Um, I also watched The Departed again. You've given away what the episode is? We did talk about Mark Wahlberg's lines from the film for a good two minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus, the film's not called The Departed, it's called The Departed. <laughs> I had to. I had to. Someone had to. It was always going to be based on the Rocky episode. It was, yeah, I'm just, I just can't resist. So today's episode is I'm shipping up to Boston by the Dropkick Murphys from the gritty crime drama The Departed, or The Departed, or however Ben says it. <laughs> I preferred your version. <laughs> the Departed? <laughs> I don't know, I thought yours was less overpronounced. Yours was kind of like soul. It was like you were really committing to the role. Ben was just going full Mark Wahlberg, that's what I thought. I'll, I'll tell that. I Mark wish I could go full Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> So to tell us what happened when the movie came out, I thought it was you, Ben. Been more muted this week. The Departed came out in October 2006, so not too long ago, but I compilated a little bit of news from the time to just remind us of that old days. On October the 4th, WikiLeaks was launched by the internet activist Julian Assange, wherever he is now. Is he still in some sort of embassy? Yeah. He got kicked out. But was it? It was like the Ecuadorian embassy in Sweden or something, or in Switzerland. I can't remember. But then he was in this country for a while, wasn't he? But this yeah. should, WikiLeaks just reminds me of that South Park episode. Let me wiki. <laughs> it's the way WikiLeaks. It's all that it reminds me of as well. Also, in nice and cheerful news, North Korea began conducting nuclear tests for the first time. That's gone well. <laughs> <laughs> Barrel laughs today. Yep, yep, yep. I oh, know that's the thing. Well, this is slightly. I mean, I say slightly lighter, but I mean, you could also construe it the other way. The third studio album by My Chemical Romance, The Black Parade, was released. So also you could say it is depressing. But great at the same time. It was a great album, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely iconic. 240,000 copies it sold in its first week. 2006? I, I felt like it maybe was a little bit late in that. Did it go to number one in the UK? Uh, Welcome to the Black Parade, the song, was their first number one in the UK. I think it got to All number right. two and then number one later. Yeah, it was much harder to get a number one album even back then. Like I know it's not that long ago, but I think it's a lot different now, isn't it? And just of that sort of genre as well. I think that was so different. Yeah, it kind of broke through though, didn't it? It, it yeah. was a bit like American Idiot yeah. or something like that, where it kind of like pushed beyond just the emos. <laughs> <laughs> what was the Limp Bizkit first album? Uh, that was, I mean, I remember that being huge in general culture. 
Oh yeah, chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water. Hot dog flavored water. <laughs> what a beautiful name for an album. <laughs> what a beautiful name of album. Yeah, their best ever weekly sale figures before was thirty eight thousand, and then in the first week of this album was two hundred and forty thousand. That's a jump. Yeah. But anyway, this is not the My Chemical Romance podcast. If only. Should be. Um, I think all, half of all we do on this podcast is name other podcasts we should be doing instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Longing for something else. And yeah, so I was just looking at what else came out at the cinema this month, uh, and I saw one of your favourite films, Alex, was released. Ooh, go on. A classic staple of your youth, I feel. John Cena in his debut role. Oh my god. As in The Marine? It was The Marine. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good Pretty much film. the same film. Yeah, I would say so. Does it have a song? Uh, ooh, I don't remember having a song, actually. I'm sure it probably did, performed by John Cena. It might just be picked one of the uh, album tracks off John Cena's platinum-selling album. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, what was it, like, Bad Man and stuff like that? Was it Bad Man? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Bad Man. And, uh, yeah, Dr. Thug and Omics. <laughs> well, this is not the John Cena podcast. <laughs> but John Cena, what, yeah, he's from, he's from, um, from Massachusetts. Uh, West, West Newbury, Massachusetts is essentially the wrestling version of Mark Wahlberg. Oh, really? What a link! What a link. Yeah. Well, I won't even, I won't even yeah, talk like about the planned. other films. I won't even talk about the other films. Let's just go into this. Um, what were you going to talk about, 12 Rounds? No, no, no not the other... Jo- that was Randy Orton. <laughs> no, 12 Rounds, the first one, was John Cena, I'm sure. I think Randy Orton was 12 Rounds too. Oh, right, okay. Possibly also named 20, 24 Rounds. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about other John Cena films, just other films from October 2006. Right. Go on. <laughs> no, I can't even be bothered now. Um, nothing can compare to that, so I'll just move on. Okay. Whew. Okay, so the film in discussion is The Departed, um, <laughs> which is a 2000... I've gone off now. It's a 2006 crime thriller directed by Martin Scorsese and written by William Monaghan and is a remake of the 2002 Hong Kong drama Infernal Affairs. It's brimming with a star-studded cast, as we're probably all aware, including Matt Damon as the lead and no one else. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Jack Nicholson, Matt Wahlberg. Did I say Matt Wahlberg? Martin Sheen. I got Matt Wahlberg and Matt Damon mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Damon, DiCaprio, Nicholson, Wahlberg, Sheen, Baldwin. There we go. Separate stars to the line. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> of male actors. Yeah, I mean... Is there a female in this film? Only the love interest. Yeah, that's it. Um, I forget her name. Curly's wife. Um... That's a great example of what, <laughs> of what this film is, then. Oh, no, actually, yeah, there is, because it's Costello's wife, isn't it? Frank yeah, Costello's that's what... wife. Yes, the film, set in Boston, obviously, tells the story of Irish mob boss Frank Costello planting a mole within the Massachusetts police, while the very same police department puts an undercover cop into Costello's crew. Cue various hijinks, as always, who has seen the film, and if you have, what do you think of it? I have seen the film at least a couple of times i think i watched it first probably like the year after it came out so probably 2007 we weren't old enough to see this at the cinema i imagine it's an 18 i don't know actually what the certificate is on this probably an 18 considering the amount of swearing yeah there's a lot of swearing incredible yeah. amounts it's like tarantino-esque <laughs> but yeah i i, I really like this film especially when i first saw it i think i thought like when i first saw it, it was one of the best films i'd ever seen <laughs> wow and then i watched it recently last year i think when we were going through all the uh, best picture winner films and i think it's still kind of held up i really enjoyed watching it still i think like what i enjoyed about it when i first watched it was kind of how they build all these characters up towards the end and they kind of throw them away very quickly i think as a teenager that thing seems really kind of thing seems really cool it's the kind of thing that quinn and tarantino does it's the yeah. sort of thing that game of thrones took on board as well when they started yeah. doing it as well because i think the film it's quite long isn't it and when it gets towards the end you're like eh winding down now and then all of a sudden they throw all those in there and it makes you think more of the film i don't really know what it is about that kind of those kind of scenes where like those people die really quickly <laughs> not to spoiler alert I, I think this out of all the films we've done this one everyone should watch before listening to this because i think it's gonna be impossible to avoid talking about who dies <laughs> spoiler alert, it's everybody <laughs> more or less <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert everyone yeah, I just think that kind of scene always makes me think the film's better maybe than it is. I don't know. But I really enjoy this film. so And I've really enjoyed it on a rewatch. I think one thing I would note is, like we said already, like the representation of women in this is very scarce. <laughs> I think that's kind of a bit yeah. of a uh, theme that's coming across with quite a lot of the films we're watching, isn't it? The portrayal of women in films isn't fantastic, obviously. Yeah, I agree. The problem with women is common in Martin Scorsese films in general anyway. Yeah. Um, D, what do you think? So I have a slightly less positive opinion of the film. So when I first watched it, I really liked it. I thought it was a good film. But then it was given to me as part of my media studies coursework. 
Wait, you did this in media studies? Yeah, I, yes. I, we did. I, I was, you know, yesterday I was thinking like, why, why am I linking this in my mind to media studies? I don't remember studying it, but I, I was linking it and maybe we did do it. Uh, yeah, so we did it as part of the media studies coursework. And by the end of the film, I, I was just so fed up of it. We'd only ever watch it in like 45 minute chunks, but we'd never pick up where we were. So we'd watch the same scene again to try to figure out where we were before. So it just feels in my head now to be one of the longest films ever put to film. <laughs> well, yeah. Did you watch it in like the gangster module, D? Yes. So it was The Departed and then White Heat with James Cagney. Oh, great. Uh, the Public Enemy with James Cagney as well. Uh, Scarface. Once Upon a Time in America. Goodfellas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Once Upon a Time in America. Which actually is the longest film of all time. Right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Weirdly, yeah. that one didn't feel as long. That's... I wonder if with that one, the teacher actually took a note of when it was so they didn't have to keep going back but with the departed this going ah, i think it was about here it's like oh, we watched this scene three days ago <laughs> that's like when we used to watch the prince of egypt in every single music lesson oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> every supervisor we haven't started it yet miss <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just go back to the start and watch the first hour over and over and over what a film it is a classic it's got a great song yeah. as well i'll have to cover that sometime i think the departed can feel longer because it's one time point so it's a lot whereas sometimes those films like once upon a time in america oh it's like the irishman i guess in some ways it is it is a life isn't it it's covering yeah it has like distinct chapters yeah. it has distinct chapters yeah i mean you can, i think both still feel long i imagine if you're breaking up and analyzing a film like once upon a time in america it's probably easier because it feels different at different points it's probably the best way to watch something like that and to be honest when you're analyzing once upon a time in america you basically just watch the last scene that's the only thing you can actually analyze the rest of it is just generic gangster film Whoa. No, I, don't I know love that. that film. I love that film, sir. I know, it's awesome. I love that film. Yeah. I didn't say it's a bad film. <laughs> you just said it's a generic gangster film. Yeah, so is Goodfellas, so is Godfather. Godfather's a bad film. I Actually, that one, I will say, is a bad film. Would you say it insists upon itself? I actually did think that before, that Family Guy skit. I'm sure you did. <laughs> I'm sure you did. I just couldn't put it into quite the eloquent phrase that Peter Griffin uses. <laughs> so when you were thought, when you were like 13 or 14, you thought it insisted upon itself? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fair. Has anyone actually seen the original, the Hong Kong film? I haven't. All I ever hear is that it's better, but I've not seen it. I've not seen it either. Apart from the ending, it is more or less the same. I think they just different people die, or different. I can't remember. It's, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I saw it before The Departed. Is it a similar sort of structure then? Like, it's, it's exactly, the it's exactly the, exactly the same layout. Just yeah. obviously less American culture. Obviously, it's more Hong Kong. I don't know which is better. I'm really sad and rank films incessantly, and Infernal Affairs is six places higher than The Departed. Uh, take from that what you will, <laughs> other than the fact that I am sad. I think that basically says that you got similar out of both. Uh, yeah. Really, doesn't it? Neither of them stood miles apart. No. Both uh, around the 100 point. Again, take from that what you will, other than the fact that I am sad. <laughs> we knew that already. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that comes up in my notes a few times that I am sad. I am sad. Just written at the top of the yeah, yeah, page just... in your diary. Before you've even started writing it, it just says there just to remind us of I am yeah, sad. Just, just, yeah, unhappy face. But yeah, Andrew Lau, who directed Infernal Affairs, said in an interview that obviously I think my version is better, but the Hollywood version is pretty good. I think that's a pretty decent testament, isn't it? Just yeah, that's what you want. Because you would expect them to die as crap. <laughs> Especially those sort of like cultural remakes i mean there's so much talk about like these films that are kind of considered classics in the far east and then they're trying to be remade i think the anime akira has been talked about being remade for about 20 years now old boy's always brought up oh well old boy was remade and it was shocking yeah, that's what i mean <laughs> it was shocking they should just leave things usually alone but i think this is kind of a testament to like it's probably in those executive meetings like this could be the next departed yeah. well uh, to bring it back to what you said earlier are you looking forward to the remake of parasite is the oh, why? It's going to be a TV show on HBO rather than a film, but still, it doesn't need to be. It's it's globally representative and understandable within like what it's commenting on. That's yeah. what I, that's what I never get. Because like this film, Martin Scorsese remade Infernal Affairs to be about American culture and Boston culture, and it has a very American spin. Whereas I think a lot of the remakes are just remakes, like Ghost in the Shell. What's the point? Unless you're going to add something to these things. Mm. And that's why I hated that the Lion King and things like these. They just they just they've got nothing about them. Yeah, these Disney CGI or true real life in inverted commas versions of the old cartoons are just so pointless. I just don't really understand pointless. What the what the need for them is? I know. 
this is always confusing, Andy Lau, who is an actor in Infernal Affairs. It was directed by Andrew Lau, and Andy Lau, who was the main actor, <laughs> <laughs> said, similar to Andrew Lau, well, he was a little bit more scathing. He said, it was too long, had too much profanity, 8 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing review. <laughs> yeah, it's, so... it's too long, too much profanity. It's better than 80% of movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know if there's like some sort of problem with the interpretation there, but it just doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's about to reveal it as a four star film. <laughs> Obviously, D, you said it's been blemished by over analysis, and Alex, you said it's a great film. Where do you think this stands then among either general films of the time or Martin Scorsese's films? Because he has, I guess, he stands as like the American director. I think it's one of the best films of the noise, I suppose it would be, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Personally. I mean, it was one I would always think of. I don't know if that's because I automatically think of, oh, well, what, what was nominated for Best Pictures around that time? What kind of won? I mean, obviously, I don't think the same about Crash, for instance, but um, <laughs> I think I really like this film. And when I rewatched the films from around that time to sort of when we were doing the uh, the best films, I thought it was one of the ones that still stood up as a really good film. I think that's probably because of how good of a general filmmaker Scorsese is. I don't think there's many of his films that I don't like. But, I mean, The Irishman, I thought, was one of the best films of last year, personally, even though it was very, very long. Um, and I think he it's interesting with him because I think like a lot of his earlier films, like things like uh, Goodfellas and Cas- Casino was one of his, wasn't it? Yeah. They're sort of like based around like Italian immigrants to the to america and how they've their lives sort of formed from that point of immigration but then like with things like gangs of new york and the irishman and departed focus more on the on the sort of irish immigrants which i think is quite interesting where mm. why it's changed there but i know both are both, are, are both uh generally of catholic faith and i know that that's something that's quite big in his films so yeah i mean i i, I really like the film but i can understand like criticisms about it one thing i did really feel like when i rewatched it was that about three quarters of the way in, I was like, yeah, it's just it's kind of just going on and on and on. But then it has that big ending, which always brings me around. I'm sure if I watched it, the film back now, I would uh, I would probably like it more. I think it's been long enough that I can <laughs> separate the uh, my coursework from the actual film. But generally, Scorsese, I, I guess I haven't seen loads of his films, but I, I would say there are other films that are better. Like I, even like more, more recently, The Wolf of Wall Street, I think is a better film than, than The Departed. Yeah, I mean, Taxi Driver, I think is better. I think most people would say that. <laughs> but yeah, and I think I think Wolf of Wall Street is as well. Personally, it's a much more overall enjoyable experience watching it. And I think maybe it's a bit different than a lot of his other films as well, which maybe is why. Yeah, that, that's true. It, the only way I can describe it, I feel like The Wolf of Wall Street is a brighter film visually on screen. I think <laughs> it's a lot. Cho- it's a lot sort of snappier, isn't it? There's a lot more editing. Yeah. I feel it feels like they were all having a lot of fun making it. Yeah, it's quite infectious. Yeah, yeah, the cast are really great in it, and. Maybe he felt like the shackles are off a bit with something like that because it's kind of so over the top and it's sort of not confined into genre in the way that some of his other pieces are, maybe. Yeah, I think it makes me slightly uncomfortable that a man in his late 70s was directing a heck of a lot of drug and orgy scenes. I'd probably say The Departed is better than Wolf of Wall Street. I think Goodfellas is his best film and then Raging Bull. But we're all saying different films and I think it just shows how good of a back catalogue he does have. I think that's it, isn't it? Like you sort of you forget all of the films, and like when he said Wolf of Wall Street, I was like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> that was only like th- three or four years ago. There's loads. Shutter Island was a massive success. Shutter Island as well. That I even I even read like a list of these films yesterday, and I, and I saw Shutter Island. I was like, oh, that's probably one of my favorite ones, and I've just completely forgotten about it. Just <laughs> yeah, he is a huge, huge director, and yeah. This film, I mean, we've kind of touched on it. It was a critical success, massively successful. Did pretty well at the box office. Won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Film Editing, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Surprisingly, and I didn't really know this, this was Martin Scorsese's first and only ever Best Director win. Do people find that surprising? No, that's weird. I think I already knew that because I remembered it. This was one of the very first Oscars I watched, and I remembered that being a big talking point of it was that he'd won Best Director for this and had never won before. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's obviously never won since either, which I think is also quite surprising. I think it's that people might have thought, similar to when Leonardo DiCaprio won it for The Revenant, that it was kind of just a lifetime honouring achievement, as in yeah. he's done better films that he should have won for. Like, Leo's done a lot better films than The Revenant, but he won it for that one either because the competition wasn't as good or people just thought, yeah, he deserves one, it's Leo. He shouldn't have won for The Revenant. No, he shouldn't have. No, definitely not. It wasn't even acting. 
<laughs> it's that classic thing. It's more acting rather than good acting, isn't it? I sort of almost couldn't credit the performance because I didn't enjoy the film that much. So, um, yeah, I, I think I was weird day one for that. When I mean, because he was nominated for this, was he not? Or was this the year that he was also nominated for Blood Diamond? There was like a year where he was nominated twice. I don't think he. I don't think he was nominated for this because just reading about it, it, only mentioned Mark Wahlberg because he was nominated for Best Supporting, Best Supporting. Actor. Yeah, and he lost to Alan Arkin from Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, which is fair enough. Yeah, because it's a great film. But yes, I'm shipping up to Boston as performed by the Dropkick Murphys was not nominated for Best Original Song. Might not have been the Academy's cup of tea. Regardless, we are giving it its dues here. Arguably a better accolade, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, you're welcome, Dropkick Murphys. If people are unaware, the Dropkick Murphys are a Celtic rock band from Massachusetts. And the song I'm Shipping Up to Boston is featured prominently in The Departed. I remember one particular scene where it's featured. I think it's when... So Martin Sheen's character, I think it's called Queenan dies in, in a quite dramatic way like gets thrown off the top of like a skyscraper or a large apartment block and it's pretty horrific and i think that the song plays just after where they go to like a warehouse there's like mm-hmm. a big transaction going down at a warehouse and they're, they're yep. sort of in the car driving on the um like an overpass that's that's what i have in my mind yeah it's the scene where i think they both become aware that there's a mole in each other's camp but then it also features over you'll be happy about this the over the title card yay so it's kind of the montage of Leo in jail. So when he gets told what he's going to do, and then he's kind of like in jail and like him leaving and then joining up with the gang, it's over that. I mean, like the band them- said themselves, they were surprised how often the song was used, and it's in the credits, how often the song was used in the film. But it has since become, obviously, their biggest hits. It's their only platinum selling single. The song was originally released in 2004, but it was released for a compilation album, not even one of their own albums, called Give Em The Boot For... Uh... <laughs> they're already called dropkick why do they need to have an album title that also is about kicking <laughs> hey the big fan of kicking then in 2005 on the band's own album they released it called the warriors code and then one year later it found worldwide fame when it was used by scorsese in the film in general what do people think of the song as in the standalone song well to me it's just vaguely celtic inspired rock music with some guy shouting i lost my leg over and over and Whoa. over and over again I'm not even sure if there's any other lines in the song. <laughs> no, I think you're right. Like, we made fun of Gonna Fly Now last week on Rocky about having barely any lyrics. <laughs> this might actually be it. I was going to say, like, I was I was like kind of counting on my fingers. Does it have less? I think it probably has slightly more words, but not by many. I'm a sailor's peg, and I lost my leg. Driving, climbing up the top sail, I lost my leg. do 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 Shipping up to Boston. Whoa. <laughs> it does work out. <laughs> <can't I? laughs> yeah, of course it does. It's, it's, it's letters. Do you actually enjoy listening to it? Have you listened to it since? Only via like various sporting events, like watching American football or Sheamus on the WWE. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's always just linked to the film. I would probably never listen to it on its own. But I think every time I hear it in the film, it does it does give you a bit of the goosebumps, I think. I don't mm. know why. I don't know what it is. I think it's because it's quite like raucous and a bit like it just gets... Yes. Yeah, it kind of really just fits perfectly in the film. I can see why I used it so many times. It is booming, isn't it? It's, I mean, I think even the lead singer said when he saw it, the premiere in Boston, he said it was so loud and it got such a good reaction. I think it's just used perfectly, isn't it? it it's, yeah. it's just a perfect example of how to use a song in the film, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So the song lyrics, which we've obviously discussed at length because there's so many different ways to interpret them, um, <laughs> they actually came, and it's quite a weird story, the lead singer of the band, he, his family had connection with, have you heard of Woody Guthrie? Nope. No? Yeah, see, I'd not heard of him either. So he, Woody Guthrie is, apparently he's one of the most significant figures in American folk music and was like in the, I think he died very young of like, of Huntington's disease, I think, in his 50s. Like the John Cooper Clark of America. Who? <laughs> you don't know who John Cooper Clark is, but I No, I don't. <laughs> he's like a punk poet. Like the punk poet. Rotten flesh. He says things like that. You can always get a guy with a pie. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. That's a impression, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's really good. What was I on about? Yeah, so apparently this guy is like influential in very early sort of folk music, so he inspired people like Bob Dylan, Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, people like this. Right. He wrote the song um, This Land Is Your Land, you know, which is obviously 
um, t- taken the mick out of by Joey in Friends. This <laughs> hand is your hand. <laughs> oh, wait, it's my hand. <laughs> no, wait, it's your hand. So, yeah, clearly. Insp- but apparently he was this hugely inspirational um, singer, especially in the northeast of America. And, yeah, the lead singer of the Dropkick Murphys had, like, family contacts, and he was allowed access to his archives. And he basically found in a drawer just some notes scribbled on a paper which were the lyrics to this song and he thought these sound stupid but apparently he was in <laughs> he was in a jam session with his band and they were just and they didn't have any lyrics and he thought oh maybe i'll just do this and he just started they just started performing to those those lyrics and made a song out of it which i think they like they obviously weren't confident which is why it was on the give them a boot for uh al- compilation album but yeah it has <laughs> since become their most, you know, their their biggest single and probably has carried them quite a lot. But very weird. Very, very weird. That's a, that's a quite cool story, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's so strange, though. I, I want to know what the, the Woody Guthrie song would have been. Like, was there more to it? Or was he just like... Maybe it was like just some sort of like... It's like some sort of like mind dump, isn't it? <laughs> I think, yeah, I, my, like, I imagine there's a lot of people, like, a lot of I lost my leg. notes like that, isn't it? <laughs> maybe he didn't have a like... But apparently he was he, he quite liked sea shanties and he wrote a lot about like sort of early pioneer. So I imagine maybe it was just a lighthearted joke that he started writing out. So there's this guy, right? And he's lost a leg. And he's climbing up the top sail. And then he just didn't finish it. Yeah, maybe some sort of limerick. Yeah, they didn't quite <laughs> do that. There once was a man with one leg. Imagine being like one of the other members of the Dropkick Murphys when he goes, oh, I've, I've got look at these lyrics we could use. And they're all looking like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> now who's laughing? Alex, you mentioned earlier about the song use in the film and how it just kind of elevates it at points. Can like people think of other examples that where Scorsese's done this in other films? Because he uses music in, off the top of my head, ninety percent of his films at least. Because a lot of, there's a lot of music use in The Wolf of Wall Street. I can't think of any that really stick in my mind in the same way. I think he's not like Tarantino, where it's like it's, it's almost like a setup for the song, and it's like okay, this is you know, it's it, they're almost like it's a a video within a a scene. Because I think his films yeah. kind of flow quite naturally. They're not like standout moments often. So it's not like, you know, Pulp Fiction where it's very obvious. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, where, where he's like, it's so obviously like he wants to do a scene with a dance yes. and a song in it. Yeah. yeah. Or Kill Bill. I mean, Kill Bill's probably even a better example in some points. Reservoir Dogs. He is the prime example of someone who writes films when he already knows the music that's going to go with it. And so it has that, it, like, even when it's filmed, it has that beat. Like, I mean, the famous, you know, when Reservoir Dogs, when Stuck in the Middle with You, it's a great example. Or yeah. when they're walking to the car, the slow motion. I forget what song it is, but, you know, I, I know the song in my head, but I don't know what it's called. It's got, like, a little brown bag or something. I, think, I swear it, it might, might be. It might be. But, yeah, I mean, like, Ed- Edgar Wright's someone quite recently who does a lot of the same. Like, he has, you know, obviously huge music knowledge and writes films with songs in mind. Yeah, like, uh, Does Something Now in Shaun of the Dead, yeah, and... Uh... All of Baby Driver. <laughs> <laughs> All of Baby Driver. Mike Scorsese was one of the first people to do that and has said in interviews like he was hugely influenced by early blues music and obviously grew up as a huge fan of like the Rolling Stones, obviously because he directed their tour, the one that was supposed to end and never did. A huge fan of the Beatles and things like this and uses music to try and elevate films and would often play the song while they're doing the scene. To try and like you know help the characters or just himself get an idea of what it's going to look like, yeah. which I always thought was quite interesting. Yeah. Do you have any other examples? I'm trying to think of less specific examples. There's, I mean, Gimme Shelter in The Departed, where it opens up and it's quite like um, it's kind of like a slick sort of opening of you know them sort of the cogs in the wheels of the police and the the gang and showing how they're the similarities between the hard working elements of both. There's a Muddy Waters song in Wolf of Wall Street. You know, when they're celebrating and loads of strippers kind of run out and it's kind of like a fever dream. <laughs> I remember the scene, but I don't remember the song. Well, clearly, see, maybe I think it, maybe they go, like I say, a bit more seamlessly. Everlong, there's that bit where it kind of like features where the lyrics are very evidently talking about like, what is, if, is everything, what's this lyric? Um, everything going to be this real forever or something like that in Everlong yeah. and it's about yeah. it's kind of like the last scene before things start to go wrong for Jordan Belfort and he uses Layla that's a massive example in Goodfellas 
that's like if you go back and watch the scene you'll probably know it just the sort of piano part of Layla and he uses Rolling Stones in Mean Streets quite a lot he uses loads of examples and he writes them with a guy called Robbie Robertson have you heard of this guy it's apparently yeah I mean what a name that is so fantastic yeah. not the guy from Lazy Town <laughs> you know the band the band the band the band yeah yeah, I mean, I've never listened to them, but apparently they're kind of like early inspiration for a lot of Americana music. Mm. But yeah, he writes them. But I always think like this guy now, and he's probably, you know, in, in The Departed, he was probably in his 60s, late mid 60s. And in like Wolf of Wall Street, he is in his late 70s, mid 70s. Do you think he found this song? Like, do you think he's like listening to Celtic music and be like, yeah, yeah, this is one for me? Yeah, it's an odd one, isn't it? Is he listening to the Foo Fighters? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe with uh, Dropkick Murphys, he um, was listening to Kick the Boot 4 or whatever it's called. <laughs> Give him the boot 4. <laughs> he has 1 to 3. Yeah, <laughs> so he's looking for inspiration and he just came on. I don't know if couldn't say, like, unless he was just like looking around for Irish-inspired music or like looking for music around in the area. Maybe he was like going to... a. Uh, Boston record <laughs> shops and stuff and asking like who's who's the big bands from the area <laughs> <laughs> some of the things we talked about before the film's been made definitely and then they're like with Titanic it's like oh we need a hit song you know it's throwing a hit song or yeah. Armageddon or something like that and it's like right we need to think we need to add a song to it and it's obviously the film's done director's not even cared or not really thought about it they might have had an orchestral piece of music that they were bothered about but but I always find it interesting. I wonder how many directors actually like think like, oh, I've got this song in mind. That would go great over like a car chase scene or a, you know, a drug bust scene or something like that. I think that that's the case. I think I think it's sometimes when you hear a piece of music, it gives you like a mental image, doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe he heard this and it was like, oh, yeah, this is like a, a scene that's leading into some like a big moment. And that's why it fits where it fits. Or it's like a song that really introduces the film, gets people to the sort of elevated mood that I want them to be in. So maybe it's it's more that. Maybe he listened to it and thought, yeah. this is perfect for something like that. Maybe he heard it two years before when it was released, or when it was on the on know, the compilation album. It was like, oh, if, I, if I do a film about Boston, <laughs> this will definitely go in. <laughs> Don't really know, but yeah, I think, I think it's more that. I think it's like you listen to some music and it gives you a mental image and you think, oh, well, if I ever do a scene like that in a film, I could put that song to it. I'm just looking at the album for The Departed. It's like The Beach Boys, The Rolling Stones, The Allman Brothers Band, Laverne Baker, Patsy Cline. They're all really old. And then it's The Dropkick Murphys. Yeah. It's so strange, it's, isn't it? It's very, yeah, it clearly just like, I mean, I think that's why it stands out so much, though, isn't it? Like you say. It sounds fresh, doesn't it? It's because like, it's nothing you've heard before, really. Yeah. And as well, that type of music is quite unique, I suppose. It's not something you hear every day. Definitely not. There was a Dropkick Murphys song on like Guitar Hero 3, I think. I think it was this one. And it was like, Johnny, you hardly knew. Oh, you know, it was that. Yeah, it was that. Yeah, it was. Really. I think it was on a later one. I definitely think this song's been on. It was on Guitar Hero 4. What, the uh, Shipping Up to Boston was? Yes. Oh, was it? As in the one where you got drums and microphone. And the slidey bar. Yeah, yeah, and the slidey bar, yes. <laughs> Which was obviously prominent in this song. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that it was on Guitar Hero 4 sort of does date this song, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but do you still think the song still has cultural significance today? Yeah. I mean, I think gangster films will always exist. I think people have got to drive for them. When people usually say what their favourite, as in like, you know, quintessential favourite films, is usually gangster films kind of take a top spot often. Films like Goodfellas, Godfather, Casino. And you, I think you put The Departed in there. I think a lot of people, especially at the time, really loved it. It was in the top of most critic list of the year. I just think it's it still holds up. It's a really good film. Well, the actual film itself has its own accolades page on Wikipedia. <laughs> and that's always good. And what do you think of the song? I, yeah, like, I think Alex put it best earlier. I think I think the song's fine. I'm never really going to find a moment, I feel, in my day-to-day life where I think it fits. <laughs> but when it's in the film and when it's used, it's just really booming and invigorating and really gets you pumped up for the film. I don't think the two are quintessentially tied, but they work symbiotically to better each other. In terms of the film, I would say definitely. And like I said, I watched it relatively recently, I think last year. And I, th- I think it still really holds up. And I think as well, it's a gangster film, but I think it's separate enough from those sort of genre classics like Goodfellas, um, Godfather, Scarface or whatever. I don't know, like they're, they're not all the same, but they all have a lot of similarities between them. I think this one sort of stands separately because it has that other side. It has the 
the police side as well. So it gives you the two halves of the story. And obviously the blurring between those two lines. I think it's just there's so many points in the film where you are second-guessing yourself, like, oh, is this person maybe a rat? Is this person maybe a rat? And obviously you know the two main ones who are, but you don't really know beyond that. And I think it just... I, I, I just I just really enjoy watching this film. Yeah. And um, so, I, I mean, I would, I would recommend anyone to watch it still. We spoke very briefly earlier about female representation. I think it is more or less null and void in this film. But I mean, not you know, not every film has to portray women. I suppose that would be one thing that I would say about this film is like fifteen years on, maybe there could have been a bit more about her character. She's kind of just there as a foil for Leo and Matt Damon, and to create a further conflict between those two. And just saying off that, Alex, as well, that was that is one key difference in Infernal Affairs. It's it is two women. So, As in that uh, character is 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 two, two women. People. Yeah, there was a, a criticism I think from someone in the original cast which said they didn't understand why they had to make it one woman and thought that was a down marker for the film. Well, I, I think they did it. I think they made the decision because the obvious thing with these two characters is that they're sort of living parallel lives, and so it would make sense that they would kind of merge towards the same woman. Obviously, it's it doesn't really make. It's just such a coincidence. <laughs> Yeah. And like as well, you think like, why would she be with either of these two guys? They're both horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Billy, Billy Costigan, the Leonardo DiCaprio character, is not horrible as, as such, but he's very, very messed up, isn't he? Yes. But yeah, if you, and, and the song. Personally, I don't, I don't think of this song separate at all from the film. If I hear it, it reminds me of the film. And the only times of, I know you've said you've heard it quite a lot in sports, Steve. Yep. But I, to me, that's kind of formed probably on the back of the film. I mean, I can't see the song being as popular with all those people just out of nowhere. I feel like it must have come on the back of a film about Massachusetts. You might be right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brings us nicely on to the ultimate question. Song or movie? I think I think definitely film for me. But I do really like the song within the film. Okay. But I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't choose to have the song over the film. Yeah, exactly the same. You know, the song is good in the movie. And so I will pick the movie. No budging? Mmm. No. <laughs> Wait. So I'm only going to go song because of my memories of this film and the bad memories of uh, doing coursework for it. But I am willing <laughs> to concede that if I, I might rewatch the film post this and change my mind. But for now, I'm going to have to say song. It's going to be difficult for you as well, Nadia, because you have those associations outside of the film. So yeah, you might true. still be like, well, I know that the song to me represents more me watching NFL Red Sun <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you might never be you might, you might never see them as like conjoined in the, in that way okay thank you for joining us today um, let us know what you think about the movie and the song uh, which which one do you prefer uh, we do a poll each week now where you can actually vote and let us know what, what you actually think so you can find us on TSFTM pod nice. I mean I can't believe I can naturally say that now after Pearl six Pearl weeks Pearl. of just fumbling over it every single time <laughs> Getting better and better every each week. At some point, I'll seem like a natural host. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's goodbye from me and goodbye from Alex. It's a nation full of fucking rats. <laughs> the the rat is symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> the rat symbolizes obviousness. <laughs> and it's goodbye from Ben. Oh, sorry, I'd already departed. Oh, crikey. Well, we'll end the podcast on that damn script then. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. You put that at the end. That's just the same song, homie. You just replaced Do's of D's. <laughs>